to start, we'll look at a random placement algorithm. And again, I want to thank Rob Rutenbar, whose course really taught me all this stuff, and it, it has a much better, um, much more detailed overview of all of this. So let's look at the problem formulation. Given a net list and fixed shape cells, which will be small standard cells, we want to find the exact location of the cells to minimize the area and wire length. This will be consistent with the standard cell design methodology that we um, discussed in detail several lectures ago. It'll be row based. Right now we're going to take out hard macros from the, the solution just to make things easier. Um, we'll have our modules, they'll usually be fixed, equal height. Um, we may have some double height cells, but that doesn't matter right now. We have some fixed places. These are either IO pads or, or the pins of our macro, and they'll be connected by edges or hyper edges. Um, the objectives of our placement, is uh, there are two objectives mainly. These are um, to minimize the cost components. And the cost components, um, there'll be area, but the area is actually given by the floor plan. So it's mainly to minimize the wire length. So if we take all the gates and we see all the connections between them, and these may be with flight lines or with uh, uh, assuming some sort of a uh, Manhattan type of uh, wiring uh, solution. So we want to add up all these wire lengths and we want to try to minimize the size of them. Um, there are additional cost components, which will be timing. Obviously, we put in our SDC some sort of timing constraint and congestion is one of the important ones that we'll discuss. So congestion could be, let's take a, um, uh, a cut here through the floor plan at any given place and we'll count the number of nets that go through it and that's uh, the we want to minimize the number of nets that go through any cut either horizontal or vertical in our uh, floor plan. So um, we're going to start by building a very simple placer in fact a trio placer not necessarily a good one but let's just start with this as a basic um, way to go about our algorithm. So we uh, will assume a very simple chip model. We'll have a grid of different locations called 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, on the x-axis and by the y-axis. And we'll assume that each of our cells can go into one of these grid places. Um, and for our pins, we'll put them at um, set places, uh, at fixed places on the edges. We'll assume a simple gate model. So all of the cells have the same size. They can fit inside exactly one of these grid points. In reality, of course, the cells are of different widths of the same height, usually with uh, our site definition. But we will assume that uh, our cells can just go and fit inside one cell inside each grid position. Um, we need a cost metric. And our basic cost metric, again, looking at our previous slide, is that we want to minimize the wire length. OK, so we need to um, define what our cost metric is, and we'll, we'll use a, a metric called the half perimeter wire length, or HPWL. This is just one metric. It's not uh, the, it may not be the best metric. It is for sure not the only metric, but let's just use this as a, as a first way to, to do things. So how do we use the half perimeter wire length? We look at our cells and we put a bounding box that um, contains every single cell that's on that net and we look at the half perimeter of this bounding box. So the half perimeter is basically taking the difference in the x-axis plus the difference in the y-axis, or it's as exactly as taking the perimeter and dividing it by two. That's why it's half perimeter wire length. So in this case, um, this cell is set at three, one. So th uh, the x, the delta x is three minus one equals two. And the uh, this one is placed at one, four. So four minus one is three. And we get a half perimeter wire length of two plus three, which equals five. Now, why is that good? Um, as we see, it kind of tells us what the two-point net probably looks like when we're assuming this type of Manhattan routing where we can only route vertically and horizontally. But how does it deal with a larger net? So let's say we have a four-point net. Where, uh, so this gate has a fan out of three, and it's driving this cell, this cell, and this cell. Well, why is this half perimeter wire length a kind of a good estimator? Um, because we don't have to separately route each one of these nets and count all the half perimeters of each one of these nets. Um, in fact, because this is uh, this is um, uh, connections that are shorted together, we can usually just branch off by touching any part of our net and going to the next uh, cell. So using the half perimeter wire length, we, we bound all of these cells and it gives a much more um, realistic kind of a estimation of how much each additional net adds to the wire length because this cell doesn't add much to our general wire length. So in this case, we get four, uh, we get uh, on the y axis five minus, um, minus uh, one, and on the x axis, we get four minus one, and uh, altogether half perimeter wire length of seven. 
So now that we have our cost metric and our definition of our model, we can uh, define a simple algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something really, well, not very naive. We're going to just randomly place each uh, gate. So we're going to start here, and this is kind of a pseudocode for our, our design. For each gate, which is called GI in our net list, let's place GI in some random XY um, location that is not preoccupied by a, a previous iteration of our of our for each loop okay and then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the half perimeter wire length we're going to start at zero and then go over every single net in the net list and add to our total wire length we're going to add the half perimeter wire length of that net so then we're going to apply what's called random iterative improvement you can also call it hill climbing okay we're going to pick a random uh, pair of gates so um, we're going to just pick two gates gi and gj just any random pair we're going to swap between them we're going to change their locations we're going to re uh, and then we're going to recalculate our um, our uh, our wire length so if the difference in our wire length the new half perimeter wire length minus the old perimeter wire length if it got smaller then we're going to accept the swap if not we're going to undo the swap and go to the next iteration of our random uh, selection and we're going to repeat this um, while the total half perimeter wire length is improving once it stops improving it's saturated we're going to stop that's a very simple placer and was it any good well we can see um, this type of a graph that uh, Rob Rutenbar provided that you have uh, the total wire length and if you start over here and you start doing all these millions of swaps and you see that the numbers are millions we go down pretty quickly we, we get pretty quickly we get a, an improvement but at some point it saturates and it saturates at a pretty high level we didn't get too low in this so um, uh, it is good but it's not really good and the reason is that we get stuck in a local minima so what we're doing again we're doing what's called hill climbing or hill descending we're starting at some sort of a place in a um, n, in an n dimensional uh, um, area here and we start going we always go down we always go down towards whatever minimum we're uh, around and we finally get stuck in some sort of a valley um, and that's a local minimum in this three-dimensional uh, space that we can see so that is a problem uh, we want to get over to some sort of a maximum local uh, maximum minimum um, uh, of the whole design an optimal point we're probably not going to be able to do that on such a wide dimensional space but what we can do to try and do that is we can uh, think about jumping over some hills why don't we go up uh, why don't we go uphill and go to a worse solution sometimes maybe that'll provide us with the ability to get down here so that brings us to the idea of simulated annealing simulated annealing is an attempt by us to copy some physical traits and put it into a type of a algorithm that may help us improve so um, annealing is something we discussed when we discuss semiconductors and uh, and different process steps and uh, we just have to remember that the lowest energy state of a crystal lattice is when all atoms are lined up so if we have a messy crystal kind of like this with all these atoms um, scattered around and not in a nice pretty crystal what we can do is we can heat up the crystal that gives each of these atoms a lot of uh, energy and then they can move around and try to find a better state where the crystal has lower energy but while we cool um, this thing the uh, atoms lose energy and then they can only move very close to each other so they can um, improve their state a little bit by moving to, to close around places but they can't go very far um, this is the idea that we take to uh, to our simulated annealing algorithm to our uh, random iterative uh, placement or random hill climbing and what we do is we take the probability of a move that uh, comes from physics where the probability is e to the power of, uh, of minus the change in energy divided by kt and um, the, the higher the energy is the um, higher the probability is that we will take a move the lower the energy is the colder the, the temperature is the lower um, the probability we take a move is so we make fewer big jumps um, this is the idea of simulated annealing. Let's see. Uh, let's see it in uh, the algorithm that does it, and then let's see how it works. Okay, so we'll start with the same basic algorithm. We do a random initial placement. We swap two random gates. We evaluate the change in half perimeter wire length, and if the wire length improves, we accept the change. So this is what we're doing over here in this part of the algorithm. But the question is what happens if the wire length increases so if delta l is smaller than zero then we keep the swap but if not what do we do 
we evaluate the annealing probability function. So instead of delta E, the change in energy before, we look at the delta L, the change in wire length. And we have this parameter T, which is the um, simulated temperature. It's not real temperature, but it's some sort of simulated temperature. So we take this P as E to the power of minus delta L over T. And then we choose a, random un a uniform random number R that's between 0 and 1. And we evaluate if R is smaller than P, if um, the random number is smaller than this P value, then we keep the swap. Um, if not, then we get rid of the swap, and the question is, what is T? And as I said, T is this type of a simulated temperature, so it's, uh, it starts hot and it cools down. That means that there is a much higher probability at the beginning of our algorithm that R will be smaller than P, uh, because P will be larger. But as we cool down, as we take a cooler temperature, P will be smaller, so the chance that R is bigger than P goes under, the, uh, goes lower. So as we see here, what we do uh, if uh, is that after a certain number of swaps, we go and we um, change T, we make T colder. Um, when, once we stop getting any improvement, we go to this frozen state and then we go out of our while loop. So what we do is at each temperature, we take a certain number, a large number of simulations. We uh, do the simulations. Sometimes we take them, sometimes we don't. Then we um, uh, decrease our temperature. Um, we do again another number of simulations and so forth and so on. So let's see, does this work? Hmm. Well, yes, it works really well. We can see here that uh, as we take our temperature from high to low, we're going this way, we're going uh, to the left in this case, we start with a, a high wire length, and this is for a 10 by 10 lattice, a 10 by 10 grid with a thousand moves per temperature. What we do is we start going down until we get a real low, um, low wire length. Um, we can see that it works at a much bigger lattice too. So we have 100 by 100 lattice and here we have 250,000 moves per temperature and we get something here that's very interesting. It's called an S curve. You see this S, we always get this S. At first it takes a long time to start really improving and the reason for that is that we, with a high temperature we take a lot of these big moves. But then quickly we start improving with a, um, with a regular hill climbing. Uh, we start going downhill towards a local minimum. And then finally we get stuck kind of in our local minimum because uh, we can't take very big jumps. The probability of taking a jump is, is really low. So many EDA algorithms use simulated annealing. The question is, does it find an optimal solution? And the, the answer is, of course, no. It does not find an optimal solution. This is a complete heuristic based on a random uh, type of a process, but it is really good at avoiding local minima and getting out of them. So what happens if I run it again? Of course, I'll get a different answer each time because it's random um, when we actually take a uh, move or we get rid of it, and it's random where we start and what kind of area in our design space we get stuck at. But I just want to mention this is not how placers work today, and that will do in a moment after we go into today's chip hall of fame. So the chip we're going to be discussing today is um, Deep Blue. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's really relevant for today because artificial intelligence is becoming a larger part of our lives. And one of the guys uh, that started this was uh, Deep Blue that a lot of people know. Uh, it was a pretty big thing in pop culture because this was the first computer to actually beat a reigning chess uh, chess champion and here we have Gary Kasparov playing against this guy who was just doing the moves that Deep Blue uh, told him to do. The first time it won a whole tournament was in May 1997. Um, there were 1.5 million transistors on the main chip there uh, providing 11.38 giga floating point operations per second. It could make 200 million chess moves per second and Kasparov said the moves were uncomputer like and that they exerted great psychological pre pressures on him as a chess player. So um, Deep Blue was inducted into the IEEE Chip Hall of Fame in 2017, and we just wanted to commemorate it. 